Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome to Active Lab live stream number 24.1. Today it's June 22nd, 2021, and we're going to be discussing the paper An Empirical Evaluation of Active Inference in Multi Armed Bandits with several of the authors. So, thanks everyone for joining. Welcome to the Active Inference Lab. We are a participatory online lab that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. You can find us at the links here on this screen. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so that we can improve on our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome here, and we'll be following good video etiquette for live streams. This short link has a schedule of all the live streams that we've been doing and will do for 2021. And we're here today on June 22nd in number 24.1, which is the middle of the three-part series on this paper about multi-armed bandits. The dot zero video 24.0 had some context and some background on this paper that we're gonna be discussing an empirical evaluation of active inference in multi-armed bandits. And today we're here with three of the authors. So thanks so much for all of you who are joining today because we'll have a lot to discuss and learn about. And in today's discussion for 24.1, we're gonna first just go for some introductions and then we're going to have a presentation by the author and then we're going to just open it up for discussion. So if you're here on the video call or if you're watching live in the live chat, just feel free to ask any question and we can go wherever people are interested in going. So that being said, here we are in the introductions. We'll just go around and introduce ourselves and say hello. And then especially for the authors who are joining for the first time, it'd be awesome to hear anything you wanna say or we'll ask you questions as well. So I'm Daniel, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in California and I'll pass to Dave. I'm in the tropical mountainous rainforest, 120 miles north of Manila. My background is in cybernetic learning theory, general psychology, and machine translation, but not much math. So I'm floundering with much of the active inference world. Cool. We'll go to Sarah and then continue on. Uh, I'm Sarah. I'm a postdoc in Dresden together with Dimitri. My original background is physics and biophysics, but I wrote my dissertation essentially about active inference, um, especially applied to habit learning. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, uh, and going on to Dimitri. Uh, should we let Trevor introduce himself? I don't know. I'm not sure if he wants to do that. Okay, I mean, I can also introduce him shortly. So Hervo is our uh, colleague from uh, UCL previously. So he worked in Max Planck, UCL Center for Computational Psychiatry and Aging Research. And currently he's switched to industry. So he's um, working in Second Mind uh, on uh, applied reinforcement learning there. So basically he's a, a ex expert on this other part of stuff, which, <laughs> which don't cover active inference, right? Um, so, and uh, yeah, I'm also a postdoc, Technical University of Dresden. Uh, both me and Sarah are at the chair for neuroimaging, uh, where like the head of the chair is Stefan Kiebel. Uh, and and uh, yeah, we, we have been involved so, with active inference for a while now, since probably 2015, 16, and uh, have been applying it to various questions regarding human behavior, cognitive control, uh, decision making in dynamic environments, and similar. Um, and yes, so um, should I kind of switch to the slides now, or sure, we can go what to the slides, think? or if I can just ask one general question to any of the authors who wanted to respond. Was it that you were interested in active inference and then looking for domains to apply it in? Or were you interested in a domain and then sort of found active inference as a way to integrate what you were working on? I, yeah, well, I mean, so my background is also like right in physics, complex systems uh, and computational neuroscience. And as physicists, we like to 
think about these unifying theories. <laughs> so in this sense, active inference has this appeal that it can collect, connect a very kind of distinct way of basically thinking about decision making. Uh, thermodynamics, mm, right, uh, stochastics dynamics, and uh, very kind of different areas of, of understanding dynamical systems, so to say, uh, and kind of mm, control. So that's, that would be the appeal. And uh, right, uh, I mean, definitely uh, as a tool to apply like to decision-making human, understanding human behavior, this is kind of where this all started, right? Mm. So what new can we learn basically uh, using this approach? Cool. And Sarah, any thoughts about, especially I'm curious about the biology side, because we hear a lot about the math and the mm -hmm. physics verging towards active inference, but it's also cool to hear about biology. And that was my background as well. Um, my background is rather in biophysics, so I'm only tangentially in biology. But what I like is also that it connects to some general information processing scheme in the brain. And actually, my master's thesis, I was working way, way down in the abstraction hierarchy on spiking neural networks and like receptor dynamics. And actually, in this area, I find it easy to not see the forest for the trees. And I think actually connecting upwards and ask the question, what is the general information processing that's going on? And then connecting back downwards again is what also um, attracted me to active inference. Awesome. So as usual, people will be, uh, I guess, joining or leaving. I'll unshare this screen. And Dimitri, if you want to, uh, jump into the presentation that'd be awesome yes <clears throat> okay so you see I yep. hope this looks slides. great and uh, i'll crop everything so go for it excellent okay so let me start with a bit kind of motivation for this work uh so as well, you realize kind of our involvement with active inference came from this kind of uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, direction. Uh, and well, originally not so interested in the technical or so machine learning side of it. Uh, however, if one thinks about uh, multi arm bandits, right, as a very general uh, problem, uh, which kind of generalizes resource allocation problems. Then one realizes that this is most of kind of behavioral um, experiments can be cast into this kind of framework, right? And one sees this in a range of kind of uh, experiment experimental cognitive neuroscience uh, domains like decision making in dynamic environments, value based decision making, structure learning, and, and similar. Uh, uh, one can also think about like uh, um, attention as a resource allocation problem, right? So it's kind of, there are many other domains where maybe they're not explicitly talking about multi-arm bandits as such, but they can also be cast uh, into this uh, general framework. And for example, for from decision-making dynamic environments, one of the most well-known kind of uh, tasks is a, probably like re uh, reversal learning task, right? Uh, that's kind of uh, used in, uh, hundreds of papers. Uh, uh, and uh, this is also kind of what initially motivated me <laughs> to make this paper. Uh, it's a kind of just uh, understanding. So if I apply active inference to reversal, reversal learning tasks, how, how does this compare to other like alternative decision making uh, approaches we, we can apply to that, right? Uh, however, right besides this kind of uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, uh, direction, uh, multi arm bandits have uh, like a range of industrial applications. Uh, they are really used, like, I don't know, starting from marketing to finance, like uh, recommendation systems in finance for trading applications, uh, I, in, even in many like optimization problems in uh, like deep learning, right? Yeah, there are lots of papers actually showing how you can speed up learning by mm, 
uh, finding kind of better sets of examples for uh, for deep, deep, deep learning uh, uh, systems. Uh, and right, so basically in a way this also kind of allows then active inference to bridge this <laughs> into machine learning gap and find new uh, applications there. If it, it find, if it kind of shows to be useful for this kind of multi arm bandit setup as, as kind of adding something new to the existing work. Right. Uh, and uh, when we talk kind of multi arm bandits have a range of different uh, formulations. Uh, today we will talk about stationary bandits and dynamic bandits, uh, where it just means that uh, reward probabilities either are fixed over time or change. Uh, in different ways. However, people also right, uh, uh, discuss adversarial bandits, risk-aware bandits, uh, contextual bandits. One can also talk about non-Markovian bandits, right, that kind of rewards uh, depend on a sequence of actions or have kind of uh, some memory dependence in the system and so on, right? There's really like a range of different uh, kind of structural definitions of multi arm bandits, which kind of then require uh, a different way of, of thinking about the problem. Uh, and this is potentially right, something uh, also interesting for the future, right? expanding uh, what we did here uh, into these other domains and seeing if, again, uh, this, the results are generalizable to other uh, uh, definitions of multi arm bending problems. Uh, okay, so just uh, how I structured the slide so far. We have like big two parts. One is on, about stationary bandits, and then we will switch. We will go to switching bandits. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. Given that we have two hours, I hope <laughs> that will be enough time. But if yeah, if not, we can also continue for the next session. For example, with switching bandits or so. Let's see. Let's see how this goes. Um, okay. So, what is stationary bandit? So the Definition of the problem is as follows, right? On any trial, an agent makes a choice between k arms. Uh, choice outcomes are bi binary variables. So we have kind of focus here on Bernoulli bandits. Uh, outcomes can also be drawn from any other distribution. So then, for example, you talk about Gaussian bandits or uh, yeah, depending on the on the how the rewards are generated. We will just uh, uh, work with Bernoulli here, here bandits, um, and we, ha we, we have fixed uh, reward probabilities in a very specific way. So there is only one arm which has a uh, reward probability associated with p max, which is one half plus some uh, term epsilon, like, which is larger than zero, and all other uh, all uh, reward probabilities associated with other arms are just fixed to one half. Uh, this kind of uh, allows us to like control the difficulty of the task. So, but because the sm smaller the epsilon is, the, the closer to zero is, uh, the more difficult it is to distinguish the best arm from from others, and the more samples one needs to draw to kind of realize the difference. Right? Uh, and uh, right beside this, like the best arm advantage term, uh, one also mm, realizes that right number of arms k is also increasing the difficulty. The more arms you have, the more time you need to figure out what is the correct arm to play. Okay. So just to give you an illustration of the example, right? we have four arm bandit here. Uh, so whenever you kind of agent pulls one of the arms, uh, it, gets, it gets either zero or one. So we can think of this as a reward or absence of a reward. Right? Uh, Beliefs about the reward probabilities. Uh, we will assume that uh, right, these are beta distributed. So we will use beta distribution to model kind of uh, a representation of reward probabilities associated with each arm. Uh, and we will use um, Bayesian belief updating for all action selection algorithms. So this also kind of limits uh, the range of uh, algorithms which we want to compare here in the study. Uh, I will explain a bit uh, later why, I mean, we focus on that. Uh, so just to give you a kind of you know, visual example of what this does, is right, uh, whenever an arm, uh, kind of an agent starts with, with kind of flat beliefs, 
over reward probabilities associated with each uh, arm. So this is like a uniform distribution. Uh, this is a special case of beta distribution. And whenever uh, it pulls, like selects one arm, uh, it gets uh, either one or zero as an outcome. And it updates right uh, the beliefs about the reward probabilities uh, in one of the directions. Right? Uh, so in here, right, it kind of it's sampling one more often, so it has increased belief that there is a higher reward probability associated associated with this arm. Right? Uh, so formally, how this is kind of implemented, what you see here, uh, is like to a very simple, you know, a generative model. Uh, so with each uh, k arm, uh, we assume there is some associated unknown reward probability theta k. Uh, right, which is just a number between zero and one, and uh, choice out outcomes of choices are either zero or one, so they are just binary choices. So this kind of constraints are like uh, observation likelihood to a Bernoulli distribution. So this is just kind of product of different uh, Bernoulli distribution depending on which arm one is selecting, and this kind of uh, term below like this is a, our prior belief about reward probabilities. And this we'll assume is just kind of product of uh, many uh, beta distributions, where here alpha zero and beta zero are just fixed to one. So this corresponds to the uniform uh, rate prior. One can also start with other values, but uh, I think this makes some sense, kind of reflects uh, no knowledge a priori about reward probability. Uh, so now, given some choice at trial t, a t, uh, we just apply bias update rule, and we get some, from some prior beliefs, uh, uh, posterior beliefs. And the nice thing about the stationary case is if our priors are beta distributed, our posteriors will be also beta distributed. And the update, one only needs to take care about how we update right, the parameters of beta distribution, alpha and beta. And this just works in a form of accounting, basically. Alpha counts how many times you observe one as an outcome, and beta counts how many times you observe zero as an outcome. Right. Uh, and uh, so because of all this, uh, in this stationary case, inference is uh, exact. So that because both prior and posterior belong to the same distribution family, you have kind of conjugate prior here set up. So you can just track effectively every, uh, the updating. There is another kind of uh, representation of the update rules one can use here. So, for example, uh, if we express the updating in terms of a, a expected kind of outcome, mu, and the scale parameter mu here, we see that actually the expectations are updated in the form of a, a delta-like learning rule. So, right, where this kind of learning rate is something which decreases over time. So, basically, mu is just increasing over time whenever you select specific arm, uh, new will just increase by one. And this means that the learning rate decreases over time. So, right, the more you sample from a, a one arm, the less you will update your beliefs about it. Right, so this is uh, in practically what's happening here, in, but very, very simple. Uh, Okay, so, and uh, basically this is everything we need to know about kind of this, uh, let's call it perceptual part of the generative model. So how we update beliefs given some outcomes. Now we have to kind of introduce how we select actions, right, based on these beliefs. And uh, for this, right, I've, we kind of can talk about action selection algorithms. And uh, so, uh, uh, there are in kind of in the literature there are lots of right examples one of the oldest one is probably epsilon greedy you also mentioned it during the first uh, uh, presentation point zero five or people also talk about right uh, ucb uh, upper confidence bound this is also one of the oldest one uh, kl ucb uh, it's kind of extension which uses uh, kl as a uh, exploration a K, uh, kl divergence as a uh, estimate of exploration uh, bound there is thompson sampling etc et uh, here we will focus mostly on on this tree right we will use uh, optimistic thompson sampling as a one kind of comparative example and another is bayesian upper confidence bound 
So first, both of these algorithms have been extensively analyzed in the literature, and people just find, found that they work in, in many examples lot, a lot much better than kind of, let's say, non-Bayesian approaches. Uh, and secondly, right, we can use basically for all three algorithms the same uh, update rules because they are just Bayesian. Uh, they are just algorithms corresponding to Bayesian and banded. So we can kind of our motivation here is to compare kind of action selection principles based on the uh, action selection algorithm and not based on potentially different ways how you update beliefs about uh, about the history of observations. Right? And uh, so, right, this would be kind of uh, motivation and also a bit to simplify uh, the comparison. I mean, you can like add to the list at least 10 other ways of <laughs> uh, doing the uh, right, action selection and even like mm, decision making in multi arm bandits. Uh, okay, so just a bit to kind of historic example, important. This is just like upper, upper confidence bound. Although I will not directly compare it, it has some relevance to understand also what is happening kind of in uh, active inference later. Uh, and this, uh, this form here uh, just corresponds to a version uh, which is adapted to specifically Bernoulli bandits. So some people might be more familiar with other, other version which was derived from Gaussian bandits. Right. So this is kind of in this paper here, uh, one can see uh, these different derivations and examples, how, how, how this works. What is important right, to, to notice here is basically that, so this first term is just the expected probability of reward on, on arm K. And the second two terms correspond to this exploration bonus or the bound. Uh, and, uh, so this is uh, uh, right, typical for UCB is that the bound kind of increases over time logarith logarithmically with the number of kind of trials you're doing. So basically, the more you're not selecting one arm, the more you're kind of pushed again to select it at some point in time in the future. All right, so basically, this necessarily increases over time uh, if you're not interacting with the with specific arm. Right. Uh, but still, although like right, the algorithm is very simple, it has nice theoretical results. So because it kind of it's efficient algorithm, it it converges in infinite number of, of samples. Uh, however, right, he will we'll talk on this kind of Bayesian variant of the upper confidence bound, which actually uh, make uh, uh, selects arms based on kind of the uh, percentile. Uh, upper percentiles of uh, of a uh, cumulative distribution function, right? So, so as time uh, progresses, uh, you uh, one is trying to estimate the uh, how, like the extreme value of a belief distribution, which in this case is just like a beta distribution, and and one one gets this extreme by solving this equation, which just corresponds to inverse regularized incomplete beta, beta function. So basically, the more extreme point your beliefs contain, the more likely is that, I mean, uh, the more likely that you will select that arm. So uh, the more relevant is to select this arm because you're expecting that, right, uh, this high value is still possible in the, uh, as a reward probability in this, uh, in this setup. And uh, so what, this kind of algorithm has a couple of parameters, but what authors kind of show in this paper is if you have uh, very good results for uh, just fix by fixing C to zero, so basically this term just becomes one. Uh, and so we, 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 we just use their advice here in the paper, so we, we will not, uh, and we didn't kind of try to analyze other possibilities uh, or other kind of uh, values of these parameters in, in the, uh, in, in this case. Uh, so for um, Thompson sampling, and this is again one of the classical algorithms, first probably um, attempt with Bayesian bandits, so with um, Bayesian decision-making. And it, it's also extremely simple, right? Given some beliefs about probabilities at each arm, you, you sample one point. Uh, so right, if there are like 10 arms, you would sample from each arm one point, and you will just select an arm which 
gives you the high, lar largest values. Right? Uh, a variant uh, of that, which was shown kind of last five to 10 years, that it works slightly better is this optimistic Thompson sampling, uh, where uh, one is constraining the samples only to uh, values which are larger than the expectation, right? So, so one is first making a sample from each arm, and then if the sample is larger than the expected probability uh, of reward, then uh, one keeps the sample. Otherwise, uh, you just use the expected value as a, uh, as a value, a kind of a reward probability associated with, with that arm, right? And you're just, again, over different arms maximizing, taking the, uh, selecting the arm, which uh, gives you the maximum reward probability. Right, this is a kind of a, a very stochastic uh, approach where this exploration actually kind of bonus to this algorithm comes from mm, basically this uh, random sampling from a, a probability distribution. And right, the broader your beliefs are about something, the more likely is that you will get the kind of large value. Hence, uh, the more likely is that you will explore more, uh, select that, that arm uh, <laughs> in, in different rounds. And basic exploration is kind of here completely driven by uh, the noisiness of the sampling process itself. Um, okay, so now we come to basically active inference uh, version of, of this. So um, we are kind of simplifying here things from what people maybe know uh, uh, how active inference is used normally. So first we will use like rolling behavioral policies, which means that uh, agent is not like tracking history of actions it perform. It's just kind of a uh, repeating set of policies on every trial. And uh, in this case, a behavioral policy just corresponds to a single choice. Uh, so in this type of uh, bandit problems we, we are kind of analyzing here, like agent cannot change anything in the environment. Hence planning is completely irrelevant. Uh, in a way you cannot kind of position yourself in, a, in space better over time so that you kind of need to plan something. Uh, which means that right, just kind of single choice policy evaluation, a single time step in the future is sufficient to make uh, uh, good decisions. Uh, and uh, right, uh, uh, generally expected free uh, we, uh, right, will base our uh, action selection on expected free energy here, uh, where this would be a, a, a form which uh, decouples into a, a risk and ambiguity term. But we can also think about this problem as right, uh, estimating uh, expected value of, of different arms plus the expected information gain. So how much information we can extract from different arms if we select them. Um, so uh, now let's assume that we know how to compute uh, expected free energy. I will uh, uh, go through the details a bit on next slides. Uh, normally, like right posterior of a policy uh, is the uh, is estimated as a kind of mixture between expected free energy, so a kind of a future uh, expectation about what behavior will do, plus the kind of the second part, which is the free energy about the past kind of outcomes. However, because we have like rolling policies, this term is just constant uh, for each policy. It's the same. It has the same value. Basically, so the posterior of a policy or, or action just corresponds then to the to the soft max, right, over the uh, expected free energy. Uh, and normally, one, one, one thinks like uh, about choice selection, this is an, uh, it's a sample, samples from the posterior. However, we are here only interested in kind of optimal choices. So for us, basically, gamma is just infinite value, and we are just selecting the uh, making choices about actions which minimize expected free energy. So this uh, this is a useful parameter to have if you need to kind of uh, fit kind of a model to the behavior, but for this kind of uh, practical application, there is not much uh, gain in adding another source of noise here. Um, 
Okay, so how do we compute expected free energy, right? Well, that's in a way quite simple. So we just have a couple of terms here. One is uh, posterior over uh, posterior beliefs over mm, reward probabilities, right? Given is this like Q term, this is just a product of beta distributions. We have marginal likelihood, so probability of observing OT outcome given some action AT. So this is just marginalizing likelihood over, uh, over our current posterior beliefs. And another term is here, uh, just the prior preference over different outcomes, right? And uh, this is really easy to parameterize because we, we work with binary outcomes. And we can just define here a single parameter, lambda. Uh, so the higher the lambda is, the higher the preference is of the agent to observe uh, once relative to zeros, right? Uh, and this... Uh, Lambda parameter also kind of has a role of regularizing the amount of exploration an agent does, because the larger the lambda is, the more um, uh, the more focus is uh, is set on the exploitation right? of kind of making selections based on the expected uh, value instead of expected information gain. Uh, and so this final term, right, computing ambiguity, is basically just uh, computing expectation over the entropy of different outcomes, right? So, which also has relatively simple form here uh, because of Bernoulli likelihood. So, uh, without going into all the details, this is basically how the expected free energy looks like. So, this first term here is correspond just to the expected negative of the expected reward. So, because we are minimizing expected free energy, this effectively means that we are maximizing expected reward. Uh, and the second term is just uh, a very complex set of e <laughs> uh, set of uh, like equations, which gives you an estimate of the expected information gain. Right? Uh, and the, in, in a way, kind of motivation is just because one cannot really understand what is going on here. Right? We have kind of logarithms of expected uh, reward probabilities, but then we have a d-gamma function of parameters, and uh, so instead uh, we can kind of try to simplify the term by approximating, right, effectively the information gain part, uh, just to get better understanding of uh, how basically expected free energy scales, uh, like with repeated choices, and. Uh, so what one ends up with very simple form, right? Basically, the exploration term just uh, corresponds to one over two divided by the number of time one selected the different arms, right? So this is in a way quite similar to um, uh, what what we had in the in UCB algorithm, right? The like first exploration term was also divided by something which is proportional to how many times you selected uh, an arm, with, but without right this kind of um, uh, ex expansion of exploration bonus with time. So there is no logarithm of t, and I mean this will have a consequence on <laughs> efficiency of active inference. So I will show you, show you this in a moment. Uh, so how one ach achieves basically this simple form is just by uh, assuming that uh, for large, uh, the d this d gamma function has this type of approximation when x is sufficiently large, right? So this just means when you sample sufficient number of time each arm, this will be more or less very accurate uh, approximation. And we see that this approximate uh, so algorithm and the exact, they behave very similar. So it, it is in a way reasonably good approximation. So, so you, you actually, uh, Daniel, I think you asked like a question uh, uh, about the scaling properties of this, right? One kind of uh, uh, motivation for introducing approximation is that in a way the algorithm is much simpler, so it scales better, so you can kind of run it on much more arms easier. Uh, however, like right, the advantage is not huge. So maybe uh, it scales slightly better, but you are maybe gaining like ten percent or twenty percent performance in computation time. Uh, so it's not something like uh, which destroys completely the exact form, <laughs> at least not in this example, right? Because the problem itself is simple, 
However, it helps us a bit understand but just get intuition what is happening. So, and uh, at least like right how the uh, exploration bonus changes with time. Uh, okay, so before I kind of just show some result, uh, uh, like comparison of different algorithms, I want to introduce uh, just concepts which come from uh, machine learning analysis of multi-arm bandits, uh, which people use like just to kind of rate the uh, and compare different algorithms, right? How good they are in, in solving this task. And this is done by uh, using something, uh, re defining a regret. So basically, uh, regret is simply a difference between uh, what you did at trial T minus what was the best choice at that, uh, at that trial. And uh, so kind of uh, assumption here is that there is some oracle which is solving the task, which knows exactly what was the best choice in, in, in every trial, right? Uh, and uh, so normally people kind of consider two, uh, mm, two quantities, either a cumulative regret, which is just some uh, of, of regret over, over up from first trial till the current one, or a regret rate, which is just the average over time of, uh, of cumulative regret. Right? Uh, and we will here use both just uh, for visualizing different aspects of the algorithm. Uh, and uh, kind of in stationary case, at least, uh, this is a very kind of important result because with all, for all good algorithms, one would expect that this regret goes to zero over time. So as you go to infinite number of trials, you should be able to always do like uh, a good choice. Uh, and if this is the case, then one can show that uh, uh, algorithms which have this property, they are called also asymptotically efficient, and they scale for large t's as something, some terms times a logarithm over t, right? Uh, and so this is kind of, uh, uh, one important aspect of uh, uh, at least for stationary, stationary case of different decision-making algorithms, so uh, multi-arm bandit algorithms. So they should at least uh, scale as logarithm of t when you expand, uh, right? When you go to large t limit. Otherwise, uh, right, this first thing will not probably hold. Well, or they can also uh, scale slower than logarithm of t. But uh, for example, if they increase log uh, linearly with t, the, this will not hold anymore. Uh, OK, so uh, now let's go to the comparison, right? Uh, uh, we will look into how optimistic Thompson sampling, Bayesian upper confidence bound, exact inference, inference algorithm, and the approximate one uh, compared to each other. Uh, I will start first with just trying to see what would be kind of a good value for this lambda parameter uh, in different settings. Uh, and uh, also to give some kind of initial comparison of exact uh, algorithm and the approximate one. So what we are, I'm showing here is a regret rate, right? Uh, for different kind of snapshots. So these dotted lines are after 100 trials. Uh, the dotted dashed line is after 1,000 trials, and uh, the solid line will be after 10,000 trials, right? And uh, so what one kind of notices here is that there is uh, some obviously kind of minima for different lambdas, so this kind of preference parameter. Uh, uh, and that the longer kind of, uh, well, the more trials you do, the smaller the lambda should be. So this this is not quite nice, uh, and this kind of have a, has a consequence. However, we can like just pick some value, which uh, so for example, this purple dotted line shows like around zero point one lambda zero point one, which seems to have be close to minimum for most of these cases, right? So we don't want to kind of uh, have different value for different examples because, I mean, this is just not practically feasible. Um, uh, you want to have a kind of general algorithm which can be applied to many different situations in, right, at the same time. 
Uh, so, what uh, when we compare so Bayesian UCB uh, the Mystic Thompson sampling and just the approximate active inference? So I'm just excluding this here, the exact one, because they will behave the same pretty much for this specific parameter value. If we compare them in terms of uh, cumulative regret, we see that uh, right the approximate active inference is not asymptotically efficient. So this curve just goes uh, diverges over time. Uh, Versus, if if you if you look at the kind of the gray, uh, sorry, the green and the yellow curve, they they kind of flatten out after some time, and they they get the slope proportional to these dotted lines, which actually shows the slope of this kind of uh, asymptotic limit, right? What you should see for large t's. Now, uh, so wh why is this happening? So the thing is that. The, um, uh, because this exploration bound is kind of just decreasing over time, uh, active inference algorithm kind of gets stuck into the wrong solution uh, with some probability, which depends on the difficulty of the task. So, right, the smaller the epsilon is, uh, the more likely and the more arms uh, you have. Uh, and, uh, sorry, um, for small epsilon and for small number of arms, there is a higher probability that you get kind of stuck, right? And one can see this if kind of we take a snapshot of, of different runs. So this is kind of a distribution of cumulative regret. I'm just plotting the logarithm here. So like a, making a histogram of over different runs of, this is like 10,000 runs in, uh, of different algorithms and just showing at what uh, value for the logarithm of the cumulative regret they end up. As you can see here, there is uh, for kind of active inference based uh, algorithm, you see this kind of, well, spike here and in the tail of the distribution, which is proportional to just doing random choices. So that means that basically algorithm was just selecting wrong arm constantly. It, it, never, it never converged to a correct solution. In a way, it gets stuck to a rock solution because the exploration bow was reduced to, too soon. Uh, right. So, in, in so this is kind of uh, say limitation for application of active inference to stationary problems, because this is not a feature of an algorithm you would like to have. In a way, uh, normally, if if you are kind of so. Example of this would be, for example, optimization problems that you want to find uh, the best solution for a, a set of parameters. Uh, now, for example, Bayesian optimization, finding the minimum of uh, some unknown function uh, uses uh, Thomson sampling. This is kind of seems to be a very efficient way of finding the minimum. Uh, however, if you would apply to such situation an um, active inference based uh, um, kind of arm selection or, or sample selection, uh, there is a chance that the algorithm fails, right? You just kind of get stuck in the wrong minima, wrong optima. It doesn't do sufficient exploration. Uh, so this kind of uh, requires potentially some adjustments to how actions are selected, in, at least in the stationary case. Uh, so just to, okay. Strange. Uh, I got some strange slides. Just to kind of uh, show a bit uh, uh, what the short-term behavior looks like. So from the perspective of kind of cognitive neuroscience or like human decision-making, you don't really care about this asymptotic limit because you don't usually expect people to be in a, either a stationary environment, things always change, or uh, right, that they kind of have to repeat actions so many times. Uh, so what I'm showing here now, just uh, in a very uh, reduced example, so if we have only three arms and we just use kind of different epsilon values, so uh, task difficulties, what is the probability that uh, for different algorithms that uh, you select actually the optimal arm? And as one can see that uh, right initially, in, uh, so Bayesian UCB for first maybe 25 trials has the, the highest probability to select an arm. However, 
there is a range of trials, like from 50 to maybe 1,000, where um, active inference-based algorithm takes over. So, right, in a way, uh, because of this uh, information game term, active inference is more efficient in uh, uh, targeting, like, the arms which will give you the most information. Has, has, uh, it can recover uh, the best arm in kind of some intermediate interval with the highest probability. However, as you kind of expand this after like 1,000 trials or so, you see that uh, this probability gets stuck. So it never converges to one, unlike the other algorithm. This is especially evident for this difficult, right, difficult problem, small epsilon. And, uh, and so this is, uh, in a way, explanation of what happens. So basically, algorithm, although it reaches good solutions after with high pro higher probability than other algorithms, there are still lots of, uh, um, lots of examples, so in this kind of uh, simulations, parallel uh, simulations, which get stuck to, to a wrong solution, and they cannot get out of this. So in, in a way, right, this kind of asks question, okay, what can one do to make active inference also asymptotically efficient? So how can the maybe either generative model be changed to support uh, mm, increasing the exploration bound over time? Or maybe introduce a kind of, instead of computing expected expectations in um, of ex expected free energy, one can also just draw samples <laughs> from a posterior and kind of also compute this, uh, these two terms, like information gain and uh, similar to like Thompson sampling. So right there are kind of different ways one can think of how to add uh, exploration bonus. Another a third option would be to actually introduce learning of the lambda parameter so that lambda itself kind of goes down over time. So it kind of goes towards zero uh, in, with specific uh, uh, with specific rules. However, uh, yeah, currently we don't have very a good solution for this, so uh, we just leave it at this. Uh, as the, at that as a uh, obvious limitation of just applying active inference to this type of, of problems. Um, are there kind of maybe any questions? I think uh, this would be like the half where we switch now to the <laughs> perfect the other. Um. If anybody has any thoughts, definitely I could ask some things or also we'll ask if in the live chat people want to post any questions. But um, how much longer of a presentation did you estimate that you had so that we could kind of also address some general points here during this point one? Um, well, I don't think there is more than maybe 20, 13 minutes max. Uh, I didn't really uh, gauge it, but there is less, less slides in the second one. <laughs> would it make more sense to go through it quickly here? Yeah. Or yeah. Would, would it make sense to do it in the next weeks? Uh, as you wish. I think uh, both are fine for me. I mean, maybe an additional 15 minutes okay. would be fine. So we'll complete the presentation and in the live chat and on the video chat here we'll compile our questions and then in the yeah. remainder after your presentation today and then the next week we can have more open discussion so please continue yeah, thanks right. okay okay so uh now we go to this like dynamic non-stationary problem uh and on, on any trial uh uh in this case, right, it's a very similar setup on any trial. An agent makes a choice between k arms. Again, we are focusing on the Bernoulli bandit, so outcomes are either just binary variables. However, what happens here is that the uh, reward probabilities associated with each arm change over time, right? And we, we kind of differentiate between switching bandits, uh, where we will assume that uh, changes happen at the same time on all arms. And furthermore, in switching bandits, they are kind of also called piecewise stationary. So there is like a period where nothing changes, and then there is just one moment in time when uh, rewards, uh, reward probabilities on all arms change. Or uh, we can think about uh, of another variant of dynamic bandits would be restless bandits, where changes happen independently on each arm, and they are con 
continuously changing over time. So like, for example, following a random walk. I will only talk about switching bandits, but um, from some testing I did, uh, uh, all the results generalize also to the restless case. Um, and uh, in this kind of beside this uh, number of arms and the uh, difference between the best arm and the other arms of kind of reward probabilities, epsilon and k, we have another task difficulty. This is the rate of change or like just change probability. So the more often things change, the more difficult the task is, uh, especially if you have uh, many arms. Mm. And uh, uh, we will consider like switching bandits with fixed difficulty, which is just uh, uh, extrapolation of the stationary case to uh, by introducing changes to, uh, about to, to which arm is associated with the maximal reward. Right? We will always have the same rewards on all, on all arms. It is just that from time to time, uh, optimal arm changes with probability rho. Right? Uh, and in this case, we have right just three parameters which uh, define our task as difficulty. Uh, we can also think about switching bandits with uh, varying difficulty, uh, which then just means that uh, uh, with probability row, uh, the reward probabilities associated with uh, each arm either remain fixed on the next trial, so they are just kind of translated, or they are sampled, uh, uh, sorry, uh, with some probability one minus row should be here, right? They are staying fixed or with probability row, they are just sampled from a uniform distribution, in this case, beta distribution with parameters one. Uh, and in this, in this variant of the task, right, we, we just have k as, and rho as a fixed uh, difficult, as difficulty parameters. So epsilon kind of disappears. So you're kind of averaging over epsilon in the task. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, so we will not discuss this, but how restless bandit uh, setup looks like is basically you can, uh, uh, you assume, for example, that the logit transform of, uh, of reward probability just follows a random walk. So it's just uh, uh, Brownian mm, exploration in the logit space of the reward. And this would also require potentially changing the generative model, which I will introduce, but it's not necessary. So one gets pretty similar uh, solutions uh, and behavior. So um, now uh, to come back to the example from before, uh, if we have like multi-arm bandit uh, with four arms, uh, the setup is exactly the same. Uh, and in addition, we assume that the agent has access to the underlying probability of change. So this is not something which is unknown. This simplifies uh, the learning rules on belief update equations. Uh, however, one can extend this, what I will introduce today, to the setups where the probability of change has to be learned also, or that the uh, probability of change is also something which changes over time, so that right, you can have to track how often uh, reward probabilities change on different arms. Uh, so this would be kind of example of decision-making in volatile right, uh, environments. Uh, so uh, to visualize the algorithm, um, the, basically the only difference is practically that uh, now you have uh, an effective forgetting of what you, uh, you know, what what agent learned before and one can see this for example if you look uh, uh, on this square to the left uh, as kind of time evolves and agent is selecting other arms uh, this value which uh, reward probability associated with the leftmost arm just uh, decays back to uniform probability right so in a way uh, agent is forgetting information or expectations it had about this arm. And it assumes that with time, the uh, reward probability will, beliefs about reward probability will revert back to a uniform distribution. Right? Uh, and the algorithm is really a, a straightforward uh, extension of what I already described before. So the generative model, uh, now it's slightly more complex. So be besides the, uh, the likelihood, 
term, so observation likelihood, which remains the same, is just the Bernoulli distribution. Now we have a kind of state transition term, uh, which tells us uh, how reward probabilities change over time. So, and what this means is that if uh, one believes that there is a change, uh, reward probability will be independent from the previous values, and they are just drawn, uh, they just belong to a uniform distribution, so this uh, kind of prior belief. And if there is no change, uh, our, uh, the transition corresponds to a delta function, which just means that, uh, uh, that the reward probabilities stay unchanged from trial t to t minus 1 to t. And finally, uh, right, the prior, on each trial we have the same prior about probability of changes, and this is just, again, a Bernoulli distribution with probability rho, which we, we are, here we will just assume this is a known parameter to the agents, right? So uh, the problem here in like dynamic cases, uh, you can still apply the, the bias rule, and you can compute the posterior, both for the change probability term, so JT, and for the post marginal posterior about reward probabilities. However, as you see here, the exact kind of form of the posterior is uh, not anymore, doesn't belong to like conjugate. So the prior is not anymore conjugate probability distribution to the likelihood. Uh, and this is not anymore a simple uh, beta distribution, but it becomes a mixture of beta distributions. And as you are kind of evolving into the future, this becomes larger and larger mixture of beta distributions, which is, uh, well, practically intractable, right? If you kind of expand this to open any, any number of trials. So because of that, we want to have something which is a bit more efficient algorithm. Uh, we can basically introduce a mean field approximation. And we now say that, okay, our probability distribution can be described as a product of a bunch of beta distribution and a categorical distribution, which just tells us the probability of change, right, on trial T. Uh, and uh, how one, what, what this corresponds to here, so basically, uh, uh, what is actually, uh, we are using here a bit of a, uh, it's not a standard variational inference, so where you would have to kind of compute the gradient over the variational free energy to find uh, the optima. This simplifies the things because you just need one step to update uh, parameters, both about uh, change and uh, change probability and about uh, right reward probabilities. Uh, this makes it not super optimal, so there are better solutions how I can do this, but it's very efficient. So, and uh, in in the end, for the Bernoulli bandits, this is there is will not be much difference. Uh, you can use better algorithms, but uh, this gives you just marginal advantage on the long run, uh, just because the the problem is very noisy and it's very difficult to actually uh, figure out the correct choice. So, what this Variational smile does so. It was introduced by Vasiliki uh, in well, quite recently, uh, 2021. Uh, so they, they provide you a bit uh, more detailed justification for what I'm uh, what I'm saying here. I'm just paraphrasing paraphrasing a bit uh, how the algorithm is defined. So basically, we can associate the marginal about change probability with the exact posterior marginal, because you can compute this analytically. And then we use this as a, a basically a, a known, a known belief about change probability to estimate, uh, to estimate re reward probabilities by right, averaging in the log space uh, over, over different uh, prior beliefs about reward probabilities, right? So basically, you're instead of averaging in the probability space, you're, you're kind of um, averaging in the in the log space here. Uh, what this kind of results is very in a very simple set of update rules. So on the left side, uh, we just are just showing how omega t is updated. And this is um, uh, just correspond basically to uh, forming beliefs about change probability based on bias factor 
shown here, right, which is just the likelihood between uh, observing OT given that the change didn't happen and observing OT given that the change happened, right, at, at the current trial. And then uh, using that estimate to update uh, your beliefs about different arm probabilities and basically um, uh, depending whether you selected the arm or not. So, right, basically the omega term here plays as a forgetting rate. So the uh, the larger the omega, the closer to one. So the larger the probability that change occur, the more you will revert back to the beta zero and alpha zero parameters. So the initial prior belief, and less you will depend on your current uh, current beliefs from the kind of previous trial. Uh, and uh, this also has an important limit. Like right, if the agent believes that there is no change in the environment, you will you will revert back to the exact inference and the update rules which we had for stationary case. Right? So, uh, and that's kind of also a nice thing about this uh, algorithm. It can be just generalized to uh, any any knowledge about probability uh, change probability. Okay, so. Uh, the action selection algorithms did not change. So, so the learning rules will change, but we are practically doing still the same way of, uh, of making uh, action selection. So for Thompson sampling, we are just sampling from the posterior beliefs. Uh, for the Bayesian upper confidence bound, it's slightly different. So we are uh, using kind of the mixture between, uh, again, uh, the mixture of possible parameter uh, values to estimate the inverse uh, because from the this predictive posterior, it's difficult to inverse it. It's a mixture of two beta distributions. So, so this is just kind of approximation one uh, can use for Bayesian UCB and for action selection in uh, approximate uh, expected free energy one gets with uh, uh, very same uh, uh, set of equations because basically rho, rho can just, so probability of change drops out. It can be, it can be ignored easily there. Uh, Okay, so now if we do kind of the same uh, comparison first of uh, exact and approximate after inference algorithms, we see a slightly different picture uh, to what we had before. Uh, first, it seems that uh, as you increase the number of trials uh, and you kind of compute this regret rate uh, for this specific number of trials, uh, the regret rate does not change. So uh, in a way, algorithm converges very fast to a specific regret rate uh, and uh, for different and there is a clear kind of uh, stable minima uh, independent of number of trials you're ex you're exposing uh, algorithm to uh, similarly again we see like very similar behavior between exact active, active inference algorithm and the approximate right and for this example, I will just I just kind of fixed lambda uh, to uh, 0 0.5. Uh, so in, in uh, it just seems to be reasonably well uh, va valued parameter for many uh, many situations which we see here. Uh, however, so here I'm showing for 10 arms. If we go to 80 arms, the picture slightly changes. So it seems that optimal lambda parameter, although it doesn't change with Key, it changes with the number of arms and obviously with all the other rho and epsilon, all the other uh, right parameters. So this makes things a bit difficult and basically suggests that it's important to kind of find potentially a learning rule, like self-optimizing self way of, of estimating lambda. And there, there is some work actually in active inference literature, which potentially has solution for that. So uh, we just have to test it out at some point. Uh, so, however, uh, we can still use the same value. Uh, this does not uh, influence that much the performance later on. So, what we see when we kind of compare it to uh, approximate active inference with Bayesian UCB and uh, Thompson sampling is that for a range of uh, right settings, uh, either, either with like fixed um, uh, advantage of the of the best like reward probability advantage of the best arm uh we see that active inference is just right uh, uh performs better uh already after like thousand trials or so compared to the other two algorithms this is uh uh just for 
different uh, change probabilities. So, for example, rho 0 0.05 corresponds to a change every 200 trials. This would be every 100 trials on average. And the last step here is every 25 trials. So this would be the most difficult right, uh, scenario. So one sees is that kind of the more, more difficult scenario here is the, the differences uh, disappear. So you're kind of losing the advantage. Uh, however, um, if, if sim okay, similarly, if we uh, look at the, if we fix number of arms, for example, to 40, and we just change the uh, epsilon parameter, a uh, similar trend is visible, right? That uh, the more easier the task is, the bigger the difference uh, in, in like non-stationary scenario you get mm, uh, relative to, to other algorithms. Of course, uh, one would potentially, uh, Kind of destroy this advantage if uh, changes become very slow, like every ten thousand trials or something, where you are kind of approximately in the stationary, <laughs> stationary world, right? Um, and uh, okay, so uh, this would be like uh, this switching bandits with varying difficulty. We can do the same kind of analysis for, for a switching bandit. Uh, uh, sorry, previously we looked at the switching bandits with. Uh, fixed difficulty. Similar analysis can be done for varying difficulty. And uh, interestingly, one sees here, uh, now it's because epsilon drops out, one sees here uh, actually for the exact active inference, there is like a clear minima, which uh, seems independent on the kind of any of these parameter terms, uh, so rho or k. So basically we can fix lambda to 0 0.25 for the exact active inference algorithm. And we can still keep for the approximate uh, uh, lambda uh, to for the approximate active inference algorithm lambda to zero point five. And uh, just to right, show what happens here is that there seems to like in varying difficulty there seems to be also advantage of using exact active inference decision making algorithm. Uh, it outperforms the approx approximate quite clearly. Uh, in these settings, and it doesn't require a fine tuning in this sense, right? For the range of problems, you can have much better performance with the single uh, uh, choice of lambda value. Uh, and again, so the in this case, interestingly, the easier the problem becomes. So in this kind of quadrant, the the less the difference uh, between algorithms is, and the actually Bayesian UCB algorithm becomes quite. Uh, quite efficient in these settings. Also here, right, you see that Bayesian UCB also achieves uh, quite good performance. Interestingly, much better than optimistic Thompson sampling, which for me, at least, I didn't found any paper who previously uh, showed something like this. So yeah, this is also a bit, uh, probably new result for uh, machine learning people. Uh, Okay, so just to conclude, right, uh, active inference does not result in asymptotically efficient decision making. Uh, additional work is required to establish theoretical bounds on regret and derived improved algorithms. In non stationary bandits, however, we see mm, much better performance uh, in comparison to other algorithms, and this is especially noticeable in more difficult settings, right, that you are kind of uh, getting. Uh, in, the more difficult the task is, you're kind of forgetting the better results. A tentative to-do list for like a next, next steps here is like introduce learning for the lambda parameter, establish a really like kind of theoretical bounds on cumulative regret. So what can one expect uh, to see uh, given different choices of the algorithm uh, for action selection uh, based on expected free energy and uh, so right, this would hopefully improve uh, behavior in stationary cast, uh, case and potentially also apply to some like real world examples. So this kind of, uh, right uh, uh, in into in machine learning field, I would say right, mm -hmm. this kind of uh, recommendation systems, uh, optimization problems, and similar. Right, just to see how it uh, performs in this kind of scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That uh, I would just like to thank all the. <laughs> collaborators on the project uh, and uh, people who help me with different advices. And uh, you can also uh, find the slides here and the code is available. My GitHub page, uh, I would just not recommend to 
use it in the next two weeks because the paper is under revision and <laughs> I am breaking stuff constantly. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. You can unshare and we'll yes. return to just um, discussion for the last 45 minutes or so here. But thanks for that awesome presentation with always good to get okay. multiple um, multiple times just to sort of see some of those figures in the paper. Then also there are some different figures and some different views. So yeah. again, anyone in the live chat is welcome to ask a question or anyone who's here in this Jitsi. I'll ask um, a question from the live chat first. And then if you're here in the Jitsi, please feel free to raise your hand. So um, it's written in a live chat. Since the bandit problem here is not Markovian, does this mean that we only need to consider the current time to calculate the expected free energy? Uh, why, why is it not Markovian? Well, let's, let's actually clarify what makes a problem or a situation Markovian or non-Markovian. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, the, the problem is Markovian because the changes are only dependent on the like last trial or the current trial. Uh, right, so uh, the reward probability in the non-stationary case uh, will be a function only on the reward probability on the previous time step. And this is what uh, makes the problem actually Markovian. So I, I did not talk about, there are non-Markovian <laughs> bandits, but this is not uh, what we are discussing here, right? It, it is really just Markovian bandit. Uh, but this is not the case why you don't need, well, maybe yes, actually. I mean, if you would go to non-Markovian bandit, then you would potentially need to plan ahead for longer because that would require that there are kind of uh, dependencies between your actions and outcomes which you observe in a sequence and different sequences might result in very different outcomes. So, right, because here we are in Markovian case and uh, uh, agent cannot change uh, the dynamics of the environment in any way. So it's in a way just kind of passive uh, sampler from the environment, uh, then you, you just, uh, there is no gain in planning ahead. So you can just reevaluate your beliefs on, on each trial. So it's kind of like a memoryless process, which you brought up. And then what would have to change to maybe account for situations where a sequence of actions does matter? Uh, so, for example, one could uh, introduce um, structural dependencies between different arms so that, uh, for example, rewards, uh, reward probabilities depends on the location and uh, allowing agent only to, to select, uh, to make their choices from the nearby arms, right? Kind of introduce some spatial dependencies. That would be one example where then, depending on in which part of the space I am in kind of where I selected one arm, this limits me to what, what's the next arm which I can select. And this would require you to then plan depending on uh, where you should be in different trials, depending on how you expect things to change, right? All right, this, this, this would kind of introduce then uh, the requirement for planning. Cool. Very interesting um blue or dave or sarah want to ask anything otherwise i have some questions you mentioned a few industrial applications and a few ways in which people do use the multi-armed bandit this is just kind of like um a logistical question like what is the rate limiting step in those use cases deploying active inference agents is there a way to kind of wrap the inputs and outputs of multi-armed bandits uh, in a way that's sort of interoperable? Like you talked about how the learning rules were similar, but then you, you juxtapose different action selection approaches. So in the context of pipelines that people are already using, is there a way to kind of hot swap active inference and maybe have it be deployed in industrial settings very rapidly? Well, yeah, I mean, that would be one idea. I mean, for example, uh, 
if you have these non-stationary problems and you have already been used using Thompson sampling, for example, or even like optimistic Thompson sampling as a choice of the algorithm. In a way, you already have a way to form beliefs about relevant aspects of the of the problem. Then you can like really easily swap right the two, and you just can then apply the the difficulty just to figure out how to compute basically expected free energy and test it out. Right? Or the, the different generative model that, that people might probably have there. Yeah. Uh, again, for stationary problems, that's maybe trickier. Uh, it, there, it might work in some situations, but yeah, uh, you you don't have this kind of nice asymptotic guarantees that you will always find good solutions. In a way, it's an advantage of active inference in a changing world, like people's yeah, preferences yeah, yeah. for a given advertisement or the, the situation for trading is always changing. And so it's a false allure to have something that has extremely well behaved behavior in the asymptotic or infinite case, because we're not in the infinite case, we're in the finite and dynamic case. And so yeah. it's almost like the sort of strong pillar that purportedly is underpinning these other approaches isn't so much of a gain pragmatically. So it's pretty cool to hear about that. Blue, thanks for the raised hand. What would you like to ask? So I have a question that was left over from the dot zero video and something you kind of alluded today in your talk. Um, can you kind of detail the difference between the switching bandits and the restless bandits? I was like unclear on like the timing of the switching in the switching bandits. And then also um, just like a part B of that question. In the case of the restless bandits, um, what are, are, are the similar like algorithms that are optimal for switching bandits also optimal for restless bandits? You had mentioned the active inference was good, but what about the others that are commonly used? No, it, it's the same, right? I mean... So, let's say in, in restless bandits, the only kind of, so in switching bandits, we have a like piecewise linear problem or piecewise stationary problem, which means that between trial one and trial 10, everything behaves stationary. And then when the change comes, you're just getting uh, new reward prob probabilities associated with each other. Right? For example, that would be a kind of idea of a switching bandit, so that between changes, everything is like uh, fixed. And the restless mm, bandit assumes that things continuously change. And here, the example I gave was one, one can assume, for example, that uh, reward probabilities uh, can be described as a, a random walk in this uh, in this uh, logit space of the probability. So basically, because probability is like between zero and one, you transform it to one constrained space between minus infinity and infinity. You just have a then Gaussian random variable, so to say, and then you back map it back into the into the with with the sigmoid function, for example, into the probability space. Uh, and and uh, so, but so for example, the algorithm I show, like for belief ablating, you one could also just apply it there. So it just one one doesn't know what would be the role. So what is the change probability in the restless case? <laughs> so in that sense, you would need an algorithm which can also infer the change probability. Uh, and the restless case doesn't necessarily translates to kind of potentially fixed change probability. Uh, so so it's a bit more different problem. So the, because the mm, maximum arm, uh, the changes between right between arms which are optimal uh, do not follow specifically like the same uh, structure as in the switching case. So uh, one can either take a different generative model, which actually assumes explicitly the random walk and like for example, a hierarchical Gaussian filter is something which one could apply there. But uh, there are also uh, like what other belief updating uh, algorithms for that. So, it's, uh, so the, the local or the global maxima and minima are changing in the restless as well. Yes, yes, okay. yeah. So this would be kind of this case of uh, varying difficulties. So right, that relative uh, probability between the best arm and the second best arm varies all the time. So. 
Um, yeah, I don't have, I, I, could, I could have just drawn the lines <laughs> to show, but I, I don't know why I didn't do that. I, I could have done I just don't have it right now, something to illustrate this. The one other thought on the advantage possibly of active inference is that with a deep generative model using the same skeleton of maybe even the same code, it could be possible to do model testing between two different types of bandits, like what kind of scenario am I in, or even have deep temporal models. So it could be extended in a way where a sort of instantaneous sampler might be led astray. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, in, in principle, you can, um, any hierarchical Bayesian generative model, which, which consists of multiple models, potentially, you could also right, generalize to Thomson sampling uh, or Bayesian UCB. I just wouldn't assume that this would be a very efficient way to figure out which is the correct model, <laughs> which you should be currently applying to the specific task. And this is potentially also where active inference uh, would would provide an advantage in such scenarios, right? Where you can also kind of learn about the generative model itself better over time. And that mm. made me yeah. wonder, what would it look like at the sort of human level as we're making decisions that are sequential in our day, our decision-making? What would it look like or what would we keep in mind if we were going to be making decisions more like an active inference agent than like a Thompson sampling agent. Like what would be, you know, when you're in the grocery store looking at the cereals that you've had before or not, how would an active inference agent behave differently? Um, just kind of wondering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. We, I mean, we could actually, we have some data sets which, which we could use exactly to, to ask these kind of questions. Yeah. I mean, I don't have on top of my head any clear answer. Um, what what would be your expectations, sir? Well, I guess um, it would tell you when is a, or better tell you when is a good time to try a different cereal because you may like it even more, especially if cereal recipes change over time. And yeah, then you have some likelihood to be stuck maybe with uh, the super bad cereal, but also high likelihood to have the one you like most. Yeah, I mean, I guess this exploration wouldn't would be more structured in a way, more directed, right? Um, right, like when, because I mean, when the ingredients so, change, you check the ingredients, and then now you've updated your likelihood of trying something new. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, Thompson sampling doesn't have directed part of the exploration, it's just a random exploration. Whereas it's there here, the focus would be more on right, directed exploration. And, another... and potentially thinking how to add random to the algorithm. One other piece is like, we're often comparing and contrasting active inference to reward learning and reinforcement learning. So it's almost like instead of making that decision based upon the highest expected value, like choosing something proportional to its relative value or always going with the one with the best likelihood of having the best tasting cereal, there can be some other heuristic. And so it opens the door to just purely curiosity driven sampling. Like I've just never had this and it's not even as much a, uh, a reward maximizing maneuver as it is just a purely epistemic gaining maneuver and then as we've seen when there's a pragmatic and an epistemic component to the function that's being optimized then those decisions can kind of coexist and be put on a common grounding unlike in a purely value driven framework where even the exploration has to be kind of coerced back into reward mm. Yes, but I mean, so I think uh, Saeed Noor, and she had like, a, as a first author, she had an interesting paper, The Mystified Inference, and they discuss a bit about learning the preferences themselves, right? And what kind of consequence this has. And this kind of puts a different perspective on, um, 
understanding what the reward is because in real world, you don't necessarily know why should something be more rewarding than something else, but you learn this over time and you just learn to prefer different outcomes. They don't even necessarily have to be in somehow rewarding more in the absolute sense. You just build experience with some outcomes over others and you start to prefer them. And this then appears as if you would doing reward-based decision-making, but I mean, it's actually in a way preference-based decision-making, right? Cool. I, I had so, another question about the approximation of active inference. Is that the only way to approximate active inference? Are there other moves that you could have made to approximate the sections that you did approximate? Are there other pieces that can be approximated? What can be swapped or approximated, but still retain this essential structure of an active inference model? Uh, well, I don't have many ideas what else one could do. I mean, the problem is, in this scenario, it's relatively simple, right? But for example, one can kind of think of, okay, given that we have a, to compute the expected information gain, and we are kind of learning, uh, having a way to, to estimate it efficiently, like just with this approximation, uh, there is other way how you can compute this just by sample. And you can draw a couple of samples from your beliefs and you get some estimate on the expected information gain. Right? So this, this, this would still be in the kind of, uh, active inference frame, framework, but just slightly different way of how you actually compute expectations and what they will kind of represent there, right? You would, this would be a way to add a bit of random uh, randomness to the decision-making process. I mean, uh, active inference is also general enough to work with many kinds of approximations, right? And you can do approximations and many different points, but uh, as long as you still get some sort of uh, variation of free energy, I guess it's still within this framework. And um, you separated the inference part from the action selection part, but I think actually you can use it as a model of both, right? And then you can do approximations and different points in this joint model. And as long as you can still write down a variation of free energy, I guess it's a counts as active inference. Well, I mean, I don't know even if that's necessary. I mean, I would say any kind of Bayesian belief updating, even if it's not specifically motivated by variational inference, would as a consequence have minimizing Variation of free energy <laughs> once you, once you compute it from some posterior which you obtain, and I mean right, it it will still be in a way active inference. So right, in a way, one can replace like smile variational updating with any belief updating rule, and still keep the same concept there. So because we are just getting a better bound on the marginal likelihood if you have a better posterior, so. So what would you say, you know, anyone is necessary or sufficient for a model to be considered active inference versus not active inference? <laughs> you know, just including sense and action or perception, inference, action, or agents in a niche or blanket states, these things are sort of, we're in an overlap of Venn diagram with certainly many classes of models, different approaches. And is it like that blurry intersection that we're looking at? And that's where action and inference are being just applied together? Or is there something unique or something that we can use as a diagnostic? Well, I guess the difference would be more than this kind of, uh, this action selection i mean planning is inference part not any, not necessarily as perception is inference because as i said one can think of many ways how one can solve that part uh but kind of once you go into this planning as inference part and also concept that right your actions themselves 
will change beliefs and you will choose actions <laughs> which are the best in changing your beliefs or what you want to achieve, then this is like, I mean, idea of active influence in a way. It's, uh, let's say, a circular inference problem, right? In a way. Uh, it's not, in a way, it's any more so easy to disconnect in the, uh, effects of choices and effects of perception. They all depend on each other. And also being aware of your own uncertainties. And I think if you do standard reinforcement learning where you just calculate expected rewards, I don't think you're always aware of how certain or uncertain you actually are about your own generative model, for example. And then potentially with active inference, easier to know which action to take in order to better learn your model. Very interesting. It's almost like by carrying and propagating our uncertainty and having a self model of action and learning, then we get that almost like second order cybernetics where we're acting in a way where in the future we can expect to learn better or expect to act better as opposed to just this hungry search for the best action. And then learning is only a one step projection into like what action is going to be informative right now. Uh, what's the next Wikipedia article that's most informative rather than what's like the trajectory that I expect is going to be resulting in more effective learning or action again on a common grounding. So that's pretty yeah. interesting. Looks like you have a thought, though, Dimitri. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, the, yeah, that, that's, I mean, definitely important part. But I mean, I would then call Thompson sampling would also satisfy that. Bayesian, UCB, right? I mean, they all kind of are, ba any Bayesian decision-making algorithm would necessarily have to take into account uncertainty. Uh, if it's derived from uh, Bayesian decision-making theory. Uh, but um, yeah, it is not that clear that right this aspect that, okay, the actions also have a consequence of reducing your uncertainty in the future. And this is what you can use also for as a gauge on which one, which action is better. Mm. So yeah. Um, there are uh, subtle differences and not that obvious always. It's, uh, it's one reason why we're so interested in, in ontology and slowly yeah. scaffolding the research so that we can actually juxtapose different models and understand where they differ. Like, okay, they're kind of, it's like two road trips and then this person just took a little extra loop or this bridge they crossed this way versus this person, you know, took a different route right here. We can understand like you talked about the smile variational updating but then just recently you you mentioned that there's that's sort of like a module you can switch out so yeah, yeah definitely. what is smile or because i also noticed it's a very recent citation so what does it do well, or nice. what is it different in regards to other ways you could have fit that module in Uh, I mean, I, I have implicitly used Smile for years now. It's just a very simple way of updating your beliefs. So, uh, so the problem a bit with kind of uh, variational inference, if you want to find the minimum of approximate posterior, you kind of necessarily need to iterate uh, through several loops, like minimizing the gradient, uh, uh, so following the gradient of the variational free energy, right? And um, I mean, this also doesn't make it very efficient uh, in for this kind of applications. So for me, at least, right, this variation smile approach sidesteps this iteration, so you can kind of transform variational inference into just a single update step. Uh, just because there is a way part which you can compute explicitly, and you just assume, OK, this is now my fixed belief about that. And the other part, which you need still to uh, update through variational approximation. Uh, and, and so this is, uh, I guess, uh, a small advantage here. Uh, 
but as I said, right, uh, there are other approaches how you can up update beliefs in these scenarios. And, uh, you know, in the Bayesian sense, they can also be more uh, optimal. So they just bring you closer to the exact posterior. Uh, so, but I mean, we tested these things uh, in, with some examples, and the story remains the same. So there is no gain on making things more complex on that on that level. Mm. But one can also imagine that right, in different environments, um, better generative models and approximation rules <laughs> would take you further. So, but uh, for Bernoulli bandit, this is just not the case. What kind of empirical data sets are almost, whether they're open source or just obtainable, are amenable to this kind of analysis? Like if somebody hears about the algorithm and they kind of want to see it in action or play with it themselves once you're, you know, two weeks from the recording of this, when your code is available, like, is it pos is your code set up for more of a simulation or is it something where we can plug in a type of data set that might already be structured appropriately? Uh, it's currently just for simulations. Set up. But I mean, one could potentially right, play out with different algorithms, add other algorithms, <laughs> both on the like uh, uh, learning part and the action selection. I mean, that, that, that would be super useful for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if there are people interested in that, where that would be. Uh, our repository is open and welcoming any contribution. Uh, it, it was part of the structuring of your paper that like made us excited to juxtapose it with these other approaches is you kind of showed that you can directly compare active inference alongside other models. Obviously, it's something we're coming back to because that's the crux of the results of the paper is really the different dynamics as time increased or as the relative challenge increased as the number of arms was changing between these different styles uh and the two styles of bandit so it's kind of a, a cool thing that people could both build on directly what you're working on but also maybe more broadly instead of just a single model being presented in a paper people could just include multiple types of models in their sort of baseline paper so that we wouldn't just have to read the paper that says this algorithm works well we could see them directly compared and that's something that more and more papers are doing with active inference yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean the the kind of also the libraries we use is also this is something which was developed relatively recently like uh by google Jax. It's kind of uh, uh, acceleration for uh, linear algebra, algebra uh, library, so which allows you to run very fast the, uh, this code. And it also integrates well with the uh, probabilistic programming language. So it's uh, NumPy, which was also uh, developed really recently. So one could, in practice, link this to any behavioral data or to like, write some test data uh, very easily uh, with a few lines of code. So yeah, what, there is also this perspective. What language is the code in, one or multiple? And then what areas of conceptual math do you think somebody would want to know before diving in? So the language is in Python, I mean, lang programming language is Python and just depends on, as I said, a couple of libraries like JAX, NumPy, NetPy, so it's very standard stuff, except the JAX, that's, that's new. Uh, so yeah, somebody interested in using it would have to learn a bit about JAX, but that's a long term also useful, so go for it. <laughs> well, uh, but from the math side, yeah, I'm, um, well, I mean, Maybe getting a couple of introductions to multi arm bandits, that would be kind of a good place to start. Uh, right there, there is a, hmm. there is a recent, uh, quite recent introductory paper, multi arm bandit, which exposes ma many different algorithms in the stationary concept. So, uh, provides a bit insights about this, uh, 
historically historic way how they analyze this, uh, these problems. So yeah. uh, I would suggest that that's a kind of potential place to start. Cool, blue. So I'm curious about this Google Docs. I haven't heard of, heard about it, but uh, like I thought Google had their own language. Like, aren't, don't they have like GoLang? Right? Isn't that Google? Or TensorFlow? So, <laughs> well, right. Uh, well, uh, yeah, TensorFlow. Yes, they have TensorFlow, and I think the basis is uh, similar. XLA. Uh, it's called like acceler accelerated linear algebra. Uh, for both TensorFlow and JAX. So what JAX is, is basically accelerated NumPy. So you can just run standard NumPy code and in pure Python, more or less, uh, and get very, um, so you, you get for free like uh, um, computational gradients. So it's kind of autograd library. So you can kind of uh, compute gradients and very complex graphs. Uh, this is also something which TensorFlow allows you, uh, but this seems to provide more more benefits for these dynamical scenarios. So I have problems when I tried learning or using TensorFlow. It's very difficult to think to write code which is dynamic there. And that's why I, I never actually start, started using it. I started with PyTorch at some point, and now that Jax showed up, that has some speed up advantages. It's also kind of quite lucrative. So one code question, just to stay on this theme, and then ask a question from the chat. What about the um, Python implementation? Like, uh, I think Infer actively, or what Alex Chance at all? have worked on? What are the similarities or differences with their Python approach there? Uh, I think currently none, because I'm also involved in that. So oh. <laughs> they will also start using text. OK. <laughs> I guess so. Cool. So that those threads will join yeah, the together. Thread, threads are merging. OK. Uh, but I mean, uh, this also code just like reduces some of the, I mean, one could also write to use just the SPM code, but this is super complex. Uh, right, it would be super slow. So, so, for example, just to examine numerically this stationary scenario, this would take months probably. To... Okay. Nice. That somebody is ringing. Uh, so yeah, mm, right. That's uh, uh, that's kind of the uh, the problem there. And this, I wrote the code to be kind of very efficient in a way. So just kind of uh, removes lots of complexity that you don't need. For this. Cool. Uh, all, all the right, some, in some scenarios, you want to have general uh, description of the problem. So, yeah. so here's a question from Steven in the chat. Do you think that parallel modeling processes might be used more in the future? with different model approaches highlighting different patterns of behavior happening in different niche contexts? I would say in well, some ways it's what your paper did, but what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I mean, from practical side, yes. I mean, that's what you should be doing. <laughs> because just figure out what works best and just don't, don't think too much about well the philosophical side of things uh but yeah but i mean i guess long term one could i mean imagine scenario where more and more things become generalizable to, to this description so it's just in a way a uh, difficult process well takes time. E even for those who are just learning about the technical details like the visual tell for me was that the figures were a grid of graphs so it was kind of like three different settings of difficulty or three or five different settings of arms. It wasn't just showing we ran it with one parameter combination. Each of those graphs was a grid of combinatorics. And then you presented what I guess could be considered two different niches with the static and the dynamic. And then today in the presentation, we heard about all these other variations. And so those yeah. are like kind of toggles in the code you can say i'll take you know a1 alpha or i'll take a2 beta as far as the combinations of how to run it and so as the code becomes more 
interoperable and pruned down to really the necessary pieces, then it becomes easier and easier to expand it back out so that we can choose amongst different options for a given piece. And so that's like this skeleton that so many variations flow off of. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Well, in our last few minutes here, where would you like to uh, take it next week or beyond? I mean, what are your current interests or curiosities? Well, I mean, for me, it's just important to have this paper out. So next time when a reviewer asks me, what about <laughs> that and that algorithm? I can say, OK, look, <laughs> we analyze this. It's like that. It's similar, different. Uh, you can you can get whatever you want, basically. There. Uh, right, I mean, because you have these adaptive parameters, in a way, you can generate very different behavior. And one can also think, OK, if you have like an agent which behaves as a Thompson sampling, what would be the corresponding parameter in active inference framework, which would emulate that? Right? Can you actually even differentiate between them? So, uh, I mean, this is a potentially interesting question, which one can try to answer and which are just from my work kind of relevant because of this constant uh, questions I'm getting in during the review process. Uh, and that was actually, uh, oh, go ahead, continue. Yeah, but then that there is also this like uh, quite interesting side in like machine learning, uh, where this can find potentially quite interesting applications. Uh, I s I got started a bit uh, recently working with kind of Monte Carlo tree search, and interestingly, uh, so right, this is something which was applied in active inference as a way to compute expected free energy in complex problem. But turns out that uh, if you have kind of very complex problems, you can also use Thompson sampling in Monte Carlo research. Uh, right. Uh, so as a way to just figure out what is the best uh, path to follow uh, in a sample. And this potentially right, provides if this stationary scenario can be improved somehow. And uh, this is also kind of, you can apply active inference to planning inside active inference itself, you know, in a kind of uh, hierarchical circular way, right? So what does that look like or how does it get implemented or how is it different than just straightforward active inference? Uh, so the problem is like that when you have quite a complex decision making in a planning problem where you have multiple branches in the future which you have to go it's like not practical to compute everything uh so what people do is a very popular way to do is like monte carlo tree search where you just sample different paths you you estimate us on a sub sample of possible paths what is like uh the best path to to go and this would correspond in active inference like you're estimating expected free energy of a path in the future, uh, just through a sample. But then you have a problem, OK, how do I select the, the paths in the sample? And then you can apply active inference to the path selection itself. So right, you can kind of choose which paths I should sample randomly when I'm trying to approximate uh, expected free energy for this problem itself. So that's kind of what makes it kind of interesting as a possibility to explore. It. And the way that you just framed it, as well as what we've seen, which is the relative strength of active inference in dynamic settings, it's consistent with a lot of the qualitative and philosophical ways that people are talking about active inference as like a sense-making or a wayfinding or a navigation approach rather than a sort of cut and dry calculus of decision-making just resulting in the total, you know, crystal path just being laid out before you it's mm -hmm. really about the instantaneous actions that we take now in light of uncertainty about the present and really the past and the future as well so it's always cool to see how the technical developments while they're like kind of weaving and recombining they proliferate and then we see oh actually these three are kind of interchangeable or these three are complementary and then 
we get more technical detail and speed ups while we also get more and more clarity on what the structure of this sense making problem is. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Any final thoughts here from anyone? Otherwise, this was a super interesting presentation and question. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. The, yeah, we're looking forward to for the next week. Great. So thanks, everyone, for joining. And everyone's welcome to join live for next week when we'll continue the discussion. And the dot two is kind of like our jumping off into the, the unknown unknown instead of just the known unknown. So thanks again for joining. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.